Day four and the final day of our week at Automate, and what a week it has been. A lineup of absolutely fascinating and stunningly brilliant guests that we've had for you all week, live streaming on YouTube and, and certainly posted on YouTube thereafter. And it has just been so much energy, so much excitement about the future of advanced manufacturing and actually the current state of advanced manufacturing. When we look at all these incredible technologies from IIoT to Industry 4.0, machine vision, collaborative robotics, AMRs, it, it's just an incredible world of advanced manufacturing technology that we have been able to see, and not just us, but the 25,000 individuals who have walked in and out of the doors here at Huntington Place in Detroit, Michigan this week. So it's been a phenomenal week. We are on day four. We're wrapping things up here, and we are going to finish strong. I also have to mention that we are sitting in the FANUC Education Pavilion. FANUC, of course, being the world leader in industrial automation, and so thankful to their entire organization. We've had a number of their Great team members join us over the course of this week, spend time with us sharing all kinds of things about trends in industrial automation, the future of industrial automation, trends in their product line, what they're hearing from their customers, and particularly what they are hearing about workforce. Because as we advance these technologies, the biggest challenge for every single employer that you talk to is finding the right people that understand this technology, have the ability to integrate it, have the ability to share it with the next generation and put it into their manufacturing operations. That is the topic of our discussion today with our next guest. He comes to us in the form of J. Craig McAtee, the Chief Executive Officer and the Executive Director of the National Coalition of Advanced Technology Centers. Craig, it's awesome to have you with us on the Tech Ed Podcast. Great to be with you, Matt. And we're going to have a really fascinating conversation. I know you've been here all week. This is a topic that you're incredibly passionate about. You have dedicated your entire career to creating this next generation of advanced manufacturing talent. You're doing incredible work. I know, I know our audience is going to really enjoy learning about that work. But let's just start out by telling tell us a little bit about NCATC as we start the conversation. Great. Uh I'll just back up and say for the 20th century, I was uh, an engineer and a plant manager in the you know, manufacturing world. And awesome. then in the 21st century, I got involved in what we're doing now. Awesome. What, and, what type of manufacturing, if I can ask, did you uh, start out in? You know, Swage Lock is a high-tech manufacturing company mm -hmm. based in Cleveland. Yep. Uh, and so high pressure valves, fittings, where things can't leak or somebody dies. Okay. You know, wow. like Intel and stakes. DuPont and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So then I got into the community college network and then became the leader of this group for the last 15 or 16 years. Amazing. Yeah. Did, you, did you start out in engineering? Is that is that your education? Yeah, Tell it, us about that. It is. I wanted to be an architect. I hit the math wall. And then I moved to Cleveland from West Virginia. And I decided to get a two-year degree in Cuyahoga Community College. Yep. Went on to Kent. And I got a four-year degree in engineered industrial engineering got hired by Swage Lock and I worked there almost 25 years awesome yeah, yeah. It really shows the power of that community college getting the start in the community college carrying that into a four-year degree if that's what you choose to do yep. or or graduating with a with a tech diploma and associate degree going right into the workforce and, and having an amazing career that's absolutely fascinating I'm also going to say anecdotally I want to say and Melissa Martin our producer has been listening in on all these as well at least a third person this week who told us that they were they got started in architecture and, mm. and ended up in engineering which is I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if that happens often, but yeah. but that's a fascinating career path. So a little bit more about the work that NCATC is doing. Sure. We were formed 35 years ago by two large industrial companies. One was IBM. You know them. Sure. Lucent Technologies was the other. I remember them well. Yeah. yeah. In the telecom space. You yeah. Bet. And, and they were f focused on the future of work, for, uh, and they didn't know where they were going to get their technicians basically to lay out the backbone of the Internet in 1987. Wow. So they came together with the Tennessee Valley Authority and Center for Occupational Research Development. Uh, known as Cord in Texas, and said, we need to find seven or eight community colleges that we can start with. Wow. And that's where we started in 88. Huh. Unbelievable. You know, it's interesting you bring up Lucent, and that certainly to uh, to our young listeners, we have a lot of students, maybe not a household name, but, uh, yeah. you know, eight, maybe dating myself a little bit. Um, I worked back in my manufacturing days because I had a similar career path. I spent 23 years leading manufacturing companies here in the Midwest, and and one of our big clients back then was Lucent and the other one was Alcatel, both in the both oh. in the telecom space. And we were doing a ton of metal finishing, surf, surface finishing for their huge enclosures that were part of these telecom systems nice. back then. So so we, uh, we who knows, we may have crossed over back in, in that period of time. So yeah. 
So let's talk now about about what some of your key goals are for for 2023. I mean, we're sitting here at Automate. You've got to be as blown away by this technology as yeah, I am. Yeah. Being a manufacturing guy from the past, I mean, you think back to the way we made things back in the 80s and 90s and the way we're doing it now. I mean, you wouldn't even recognize this, what we see here. So talk a little bit about how the work you're doing here in 2023 aligns to the advancements in automation and some of your key goals. Well, our key goals, I'll just say our four pillars, Matt, are really focused on the future of work. They have been from day one. They haven't changed. Industry 4.0 is a big focus. Right. Obviously, 20 years ago, we got deep into mechatronics and helped spread the word across the nation about mechatronics. Right. If you get mechatronics, you can springboard into Industry 4.0, right? For sure, yep. So that's our first pillar. The second one's all about work-based learning. The more we can get apprentices of all types across the world, country, internships, co-ops, and entrepreneurship spread in the college uh, curriculum, the better. And our third pillar is all about competency-based learning mm -hmm. and in and really get away from this hours-based measurement of time right. you know, time-based stuff doesn't really make any difference to us you know but if you learn by competencies knowledge skills and abilities and if they're linked with uh, industry recognized credentials sure which you're very much involved with For sure. um, that's even better in most cases and the last one that wraps around all three is all about less Let's get better access, diversity, and equity, inclusion, and belongingness in our programs, in our industries to accept underserved and under-recognized uh, populations. So that's a big part of it. Yeah, for sure. That's that's amazing. And it, I mean, it, it's just fascinating to me how well that aligns with so much of our mission here at the Tech Ed Podcast. Obviously, thinking back to the world, the mechatronics, this convergence of mechanical technology and electrical and electronics technology that, to your point, we were, we were all about 20 years ago and is still really, really important. Right. You know, people ask us, how do we teach? Industry 4.0, and I, I would say first you start out with understanding lean, you start out with understanding safety, yep. you understand standardized quality, and then you build on that the mechatronics competencies because it doesn't matter what we're measuring, what we're sensing, what we're analyzing if we don't understand that base technology. So I'm, I'm fully aligned with that. Huge fan of work-based learning. I was never a good classroom learner. Yeah. I mean, there's an element of that that's important. Obviously, the uh, competency-based learning. I just posted, I actually commented on a post on LinkedIn um, Last night, it was a post by uh, Paul Carlson, who's the president at Fox Valley, or I'm sorry, at uh, Lakeshore Technical yes. College in Wisconsin. And he had a photo with uh, Kate Farrell, who's the president at Nicolet Technical College, both huge CBE institutions. Right. And, and my comment was three of my favorite things. Number one, Paul Carlson. Number two, Kate Farrell. And number three, CBE. The whole idea of competency-based learning, uh, you know, we had in the, in the past, we've had this education world where it really hasn't changed much in the last 50 years. We had the superintendent of the St. Paul Public School District with us about a year and a half ago, maybe, give or take. And he made a comment to me, Craig, that just absolutely stuck with me. He said, if you think about the way that most places are educating, most educators are educating the next generation of students, that hasn't changed much since the 1950s. We came back from World War II. We created these classrooms. Yep. We put 30 students in a classroom. We have one teacher that lectures. And it doesn't matter whether you're the student that is totally fascinated by that or you're the student like me who could never sit still, who is always getting in trouble right. for being rambunctious in the back <laughs> of the classroom. And, and, and now we're finally, I think, coming to an age where we're recognizing not all learners learn the same. Right. And as somebody who employed hundreds, if not thousands, of industrial employees over the course of my career, I didn't care how many years, how many hours, how many years you spent in a classroom. I cared about what you could do when you walked in the front door of my company. And so that CBE element is so, so important. And obviously in this day and age, the you know, the diversity side of things. Yeah. Um, what we found in some of the business that businesses that we have owned is that the more diverse our team members are, the better those teams are. Yes. And the better we are at responding to customer needs and, and anticipating trends in, in the uh, in the marketplace. And quite frankly, the workplace is way more fun. I mean, well, it's just, yeah. yeah, so I'm a huge advocate there as well. So awesome that you've got those four pillars totally aligned. How do you live that out? So you've got these, you know, these those are big goals, right? They are. You know, how do you go about implementing that in, in, mm -hmm. the, in the daily work that you do? Well, we're an affiliated council for the American Association of Community Colleges, okay. which represents almost 1,200 community colleges yep. in all 50 states and Puerto Rico and Guam. But we have about 20% of them as our members, okay? So about 180. Uh, so we work with them on best practices practices from the field, what they're doing in the real world, employer engagement, all those things about the pillars I just mentioned, yep. and share those with AACC so that they can embed those stories in the policy setting in, in D.C. for federal sure. funding. We work very closely with them on a cybersecurity grant from Microsoft. We're doing Intel, uh, Dell with uh, artificial intelligence. We did a big industry 4.0 study in 18 and another one last year with Cat Caterpillar. Sure. So we do a lot of on-the-ground work and 
herd the cats, as I call it, yeah, you know, right. and get all those folks that really are trying to do better things, and then try to replicate and scale those up across the nation as we move uh, across, you know, from Hawaii to Maine to Florida. So the study on Industry 4.0, of course, given my fascination with that, piqued my interest. And, and it sounds like you did a couple of them, one maybe five years ago, another one more recently yeah. last year. So tell us a little bit about the findings, and then is the perception and the adoption of Industry 4.0 starting to change over that period of time? It, it is, but slow, and yep. it's in pockets, as you know. One example comes to mind in Dayton area. Uh, we, we work with Sinclair on, on, on stoking that up, and we did a study of what the college was doing well and what their gaps were short, shortly, what sure. their one- to two two-year plan should be. And we, of course, uh, had all their stakeholders involved, all the small, medium, and, and large industries in their region uh, as interviewed. And it, it was amazing, obviously, everywhere I go, the small and mediums are going, oh, we, we can't leave behind C&C &C and, 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 you know, uh, industrial maintenance and welding. Right. And we don't. We right. don't leave that behind. Sure. That's, you know, but we want to embed sensors, as you mm -hmm. know. And yep. like I remember when a young engineer on the shop floor trying to uh, troubleshoot machines, if I would have had a sensor instead of a stethoscope, right. exactly. <laughs> I would have been so much better <laughs> off with a dashboard, right? Yep. But we want to help them ease into it. And some of them are already connected with the Internet of Things mm -hmm. on a small way and just help them understand how they can grow that with robots and uh, artificial intelligence, perhaps, and, and some other things thrown in. So we do a lot of helping the colleges be the catalyst for understanding we call it demystifying industry 4.0 yep. and we, i've actually been out on the road with groups of people government education industry in the same room where we do that as a starting point using our watch and our phone and all right. the things as an example of so the home internet of things mm -hmm. and say look what can you do better in your environment and and we actually get the cat uh, the colleges to be the catalyst for change yep absolutely you know, I, that philosophy i'll tell you i love to hear that as i counsel deans and presidents and so on of our technical and community colleges across the united states and i know you spend a lot of time doing that as well i tell them this area of Industry 4.0, in as much as we need to listen to our advisory boards, we need to listen to our industrial employers, this is a space where education needs to lead. Because a lot of them, and I, I lived it, you lived it, when you're in manufacturing, you're not waking up in the morning trying to figure out what is the next big technology I need to implement two years from right. now. I mean, we have people doing that. We Not to say that we don't do that at all, but right. you're focused on getting orders out, focusing on quality, yep. customer complaints making sure that your team members are, are feeling fulfilled in their roles and that you're going to retain them, recruiting. That's what you do day to day, yep. right? Yes. And so this is an area where education needs to understand the technologies, bring it to their industrial employers, whether it's advocating for it, whether it's putting it in their business and industry or workforce development programs, certainly implementing it into their curriculums and having those industrial employers then understand this tidal wave that is coming at them. So, so I'm a huge advocate for that. You know, I was with um, two weeks ago, Two weeks ago yesterday, I met for about an hour and a half with Doug Burgum, who's the governor of the state of North Dakota. And in, in the example that I gave him was, you know, if we think about funding technical education, right. if, if I go to a CNC instructor and give them a half a million dollars to, to spend on, on improving their programs, mm -hmm. I am going to get a half a million dollars of CNC machines, guaranteed. That's what they know. If I go to a woods instructor and do the same thing, I'm going to get a half a million dollars of, of lathes and, and of routers that I can use in my woods program because that's what they know. That's fine. Right. We, we need to teach that. There's no question about it. But you're right. There's this whole new layer of technologies of smart sensors with embedded smart intelligence with the ability to communicate with each other, taking that to a computer network, to a data collector, to the cloud, analyzing all that data. That is the future of manufacturing. Yes. And our manufacturers that get that figured out and understand how to adopt it are going to gap everybody else. And the ones that don't are going to be in big trouble. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? 100%. 100%. And, you know, we've seen it over the years. I remember the first time I got involved with Industry 3.0 right. was in the early 80s. And we yep. were moving from screw machines to CNC machines, right? right? Exactly. And that yeah. was, uh, I lived that. And you, sure. I'm sure, did too. I it's did. like, yeah. But it's the people we've got to get to understand that. We're, you've got to keep changing. Yep. That's the only constant you can count on other than taxes and death. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. So let's let's talk about that people part of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I know this is at the core of what you do and you spend time with educators all over all over the United States and and seeing best practices and so on. When it comes to these advancing technologies, whether it's industry 4.0, whether it's now AI and machine learning, right. uh, you know, all of these different technologies, are we getting it right and 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 where 
And then what are some of those gaps, as you suggest, where we need to start thinking about this differently? I, I think one thing that I've, uh, and I know you know this firsthand, is that Industry 4.0 is across all sectors. Right. Right. So we're talking about manufacturing, which is what, what we're passionate about and mm -hmm. where we came from, right? And what this show's mostly about. But it's in hospital systems. It's in rapid transit systems. It's all over the warehouse right. and supply chains, right? And so, and, and, and so it's really ubiquitous. It is. And everything you touch and do is connected to the Internet these days, right? Mm -hmm. One way or the other. So the gaps are helping, helping other, most people understand that 60% plus percent of the knowledge, skills, and abilities in anything we're talking about with yep. Industry 4.0 are across the board totally. with all industries, yep. right? Yep, absolutely. So we just keep you know, preaching that, if you will, or, or sharing best practices on that. Absolutely. You know, yesterday we had Josh Gamer, who's the Dean of um, Advanced Manufacturing, something close to that, I think, Integrated Technology at Western Technical College in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And Josh was telling, you're going to love this, telling me about this degree program that he launched. Um, and I think their first cohort is starting later this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's it's an IIoT specialist okay. degree, right? Yeah. So so that is that is the rule. And here's his thesis: if you think about this continuum of sensors and devices, and then a control system, and then a network data collection, and the cloud, we think about that in terms of manufacturing, right? Sure. So I can sensor up a machine tool, I can gather all kinds of information about speeds and feeds and temperatures and right. and cycle time, all this kind of information. I can send that to a programmable logic controller. Right. From there, I can send it to a computer network, to a data collector, to the cloud. And so I may be using, you know, Rockwell Automation Factory Talk, for lack of a better example, yeah. um, you know, on the computer network. And then maybe I'm going up to, you know, Azure on the cloud to, to do my analysis. So that's a that's a continuum in the world of manufacturing. Here we are in the, the FANUC booth. You have a FANUC robot right. that's using zero downtime and MT-Link I. Same, same continuum, right? Yes. So that's the manufacturing continuum. Well, guess what? In healthcare... I've got sensors and devices that are monitoring patients, sending it to some version of a control system, to a version of an enterprise yep. software system, yep. to a version of a data collector, to a, to a version of the cloud. Yep. It, it's same continuum, same thing in hospitality, same thing in retail. So that's and that that's what I just heard you say. Yep. And and, um, and Josh Gamer, the, dean, the uh, Dr. Josh Gamer, the dean at at um, Western, his thesis is let's teach that continuum. And let's create experts around that continuum. Right. And then I can take, if I have an opening in manufacturing or a student with a passion for manufacturing, maybe take a couple manufacturing-related courses and send them there. If you've yes. got somebody with a passion for healthcare, send them there. It was just <clears throat> fascinating, especially as we think about disrupting education, yep. as we think about competency-based learning. It just resonated with me. What, what do you think of an idea like that? Oh, that, no, no. That you just you just talked about one of the better things that we've tried to do is level the playing field with those kind of core uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities. And, and I think the problem-based learning as well yep. you know coupled with competency based you know get some problems from industry that really need solved right and, well, that's and, your work work based learning yeah absolutely yeah. so i mean make make sure it's all woven together and it's real world Absolutely. So if you know that is your math problems and your science problems and even your, your writing problems in English are real world needed and how they apply to something you can actually see and do, um, you will learn it better. Right. Right. Absolutely. Right. I know I always did. I did. I mean, I was, that was my thing. You know, I look, reflect back on my, uh, my education pathway. And, and I talk about this a lot on the podcast. It wasn't until I was probably 30 years out of secondary education that I realized that all these people that were saying, you know, Matthew can't st sit still. Matthew's rambunctious. Matthew wants to be the center of attention. All, all these, all these different things. Um, and, and they, they told me I was the problem yeah. and looking back on it yeah. and I'm not faulting my teachers for mm -hmm. it. That was the institution that was education in those days, but I wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't that I wasn't right for education. The problem was that education, at least as it stood then, yes. wasn't right for me, which is why it's so very important to disrupt it as we think about how we do it going forward. I was always the hands-on kinesthetic learner. I was the kid for whatever reason. I was never really good at art, but I love going to art class. You know, yeah. I was okay at music. I love going to music class. Yeah. I love going to gym. I didn't realize why. Yep. You know, I hated sitting in the math lecture. I, I I was fascinated by history, but hated sitting in the lecture. I liked reading the textbook, yep. but hated sitting in the lecture. Now I think back, and that was <laughs> the reason why. I was a hands-on learner. That's the way, to this day, it's the way that I learn. I just didn't realize that until it was way too late. It sounds like you have a little bit of that in yourself. I have so much of that, Matt. You were, were you know, as we say, twin sons of different <laughs> mothers. Go, right? right. But the bottom line is, you know, we we've 
been pro- promoting STEAM over STEM. Right. Now, it's not because we don't believe in STEM. We certainly do. Yep. But if we don't have arts and, and, and applied learning and, and innovation design and all those things that come with part of this, right. we don't have half the population interested, yep. right? No, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So Man. STEAM <laughs> over STEM is my, my mantra, one it, of them. It took me a while to get there, right? So at first when I saw, you know, I'm a big STEM proponent, yeah. of course, right? Same. And you see just the, the perfect fit with the world of you know, with the world of manufacturing where we right. spend all our time and and then when you started hearing about steam my initial reaction was oh those are the art people trying to get at the stem money you know well and, and yeah. yeah that was my initial <laughs> reaction right and then and then as i thought about it more and explored it more and had some really really deep conversations um have a, a really close friend by the name of alex gardelman alex graduated or uh, taught at the uh, at the chicago institute of art uh, lifelong artist fascinating guy we are as different in terms of career and background and probably even, you know, politics and whatever else, as sure. you could guess. And he's one of my very best buddies. And we have all these really cool conversations about the convergence of art and manufacturing. Good. And so he actually works for the the John Michael Kohler Art Center, which is, you know, the, the Kohler family um, money that went into the into the oh, arts. Oh, okay. And, and he's, I mean, he's a welder. He can, he can program a CNC machine. He can run a rigging device. I mean, and it's all these convergences between art and, and, and manufacturing. And then you start to think about the creativity that takes place in art and the creativity that takes place in the world of design for manufacturing. Right. It's all the same competencies. Right. So what we've been exploring quite a bit, and we actually had Laura Kohler, who's, who's the, uh, the daughter of Herb Kohler, the vice president of Kohler Company, on the podcast to talk about it, is where is this convergence of art and, 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 and manufacturing? Right. And then how do we, I, you know, I'm like, now I'm all about how do I take an art student yeah, I mean, there's some really famous and, and wealthy artists, and there's some things you can do with an art degree that that can you know pay the bills and so on. Right. But there's and there's a, they call them starving artists for a reason, oh, yeah, right? Absolutely. How do we, how do we pull some of those people and their interests and their skills into manufacturing? So again, it's just a fascinating observation that you have in, in that regard as well. Yeah. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about some of the schools that are getting this right. And I know um, you travel, like we say, all over to community colleges. You've got these 180 members that you're engaging with all the time. Give us maybe three or four examples that you can think of of community colleges that really have this whole thing figured out. Well, one of our favorites is Gateway Technical awesome. College. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping got you'd top say of that. the list right, right now. You know that that group in Wisconsin is sets the bar as high as possible. I was just with the Department of Defense in Ohio with uh, Lorain County Community College. Yep. They set the bar equally high in Ohio. Unbelievable. They've got young faculty and staff that are half our age, right. and they're attracting young folks into these programs as well as they're knowledgeable as heck. I still feel like I'm 32, by the I way. I do, too. Just, yeah, well, okay. 22 sometimes. Yeah, but okay. No, it's like the body's not catching up. Right. Or, or, you know. But I agree with you, Matt. I, I feel the same way. Um, uh, Rowan Cabarrus in, in North Carolina is really doing amazing. They actually built an advanced technology center over the last five years and attracted Akuma. Yeah. As a global training center at the ATC. Wow, that's cool. So Okuma brings yep. people into, yeah. So they're really doing some amazing things. Talk about industry engagement, right? That's yep, the right for thing. for sure. Alabama, you know, Calhoun's doing great right. things with Mercedes and all those companies down there. Absolutely. Uh, Macomb here. Macomb right. uh, and uh, Oakland, both are great community Absolutely. colleges. for so, sure. So yep. that's a short list, but yeah. there's a lot more. Lots of, lots of commonality there. I was actually at Calhoun back in... Uh, in uh, April for a couple of meetings and just yeah. fascinating with the work that they're that they're doing there. Yeah. Uh, we had Don Hutchison from uh, from Macomb yep. on with us earlier this week, um, and we got another individual from Macomb joining us a little bit later today. So they're doing great things, and yes. I partnered with them on a on a number of different projects. Those are some phenomenal phenomenal examples. Is there a way that they think about this that makes them different, or is there a philosophy that they had, or what advice would you have to other community colleges? Well, what I see as some of the common denominators on the best practices is, is they have leadership, either the president or the dean or the vice president of workforce that really understand workforce and not just academic, right? right. So they re- either came from work, uh, working in the real world right. into the education world, sure. or they just really understand it. And the second big factor, as you know firsthand, is industry engagement throughout. Totally. Yeah. I mean, if industry's not at your table quarterly, right. at least quarterly, yep. and helping you with your curriculum, helping with your hands-on experience, your learning labs, and understanding what they are looking at in modular micro-credentials and stackable approaches, you know, it can be a short-term certificate. We believe in, um, you know, degrees 
while we are recipients and a lot of other people, that might not be the future. Right. All right. Exactly. And, and I'm, if I'm uh, one people will tell me uh, they know about me is if I say, if it ain't broke, break it. Yeah. Right. I mean that yeah. because everything can be done better. Yep. Absolutely. So I, I actually had you do these personality tests and then you get the consulting guy. And they said that that Matt's personality is such that is if there isn't a problem to solve, he'll create a problem. So we yep. have something to work on. We do have similar. <laughs> probably a little bit of a little bit of truth to that. Yep. You know, you. Um, you, you mentioned Gateway Gateway Technical College, yeah. obviously, and, and, and Brian Albrecht, who retired earlier this year. I mentioned you already. He yeah. says hello, and, and uh, I was just texting with Brian this morning. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the things, one of the things that Brian Brian talks about, in fact, he and I were together at the FANUC every year has their integrator conference. This year it was in Carlsbad, California. Okay. Uh, I think it was in February. And so we're down in, in Carlsbad together um, speaking to all of, so the FANUC integrators, of course, are all the people that are taking this technology that's, that's surrounding us, PLCs, robots, um, you know, control systems, the whole thing, right. and, and integrating those in a manufacturing environment. So there's like 170 of those. I think there were probably 500 people in the audience. And Brian got up and said, if you don't have the president of your community or technical college's number on speed dial in your phone, right. you're missing an opportunity. Right. And that, and he means that, right? right. And, and every industrial employer in his entire in his entire district knows who Brian is, knows him by first hand. He's practically a celebrity. And now Ritu Raju, who's replaced yes. Brian as the president of that college, came from Texas, is, is carrying on that legacy and, and creating incredible results on her own. Um, so you'll like this story. I was uh, I serve on Gateway's foundation board, and so we manage uh, you know twenty plus million dollar um, pa- package of money that we put to work and in, in for the benefit of the college and the students' portfolio money, I should say. And so the um, and, and what they did when they were interviewing for individuals to be the next president of Gateway is they had members of the foundation board come and. Um, moderate the sessions with the uh, with with the potential presidents. There were four finalists, right. and so I I moderated one of them, and then three other foundation members moderated the other three. To, first of all, to give a sense for how engaged that college is with its community, um, when we re- moderated those sessions, there were 200 plus people that showed up for the session just to hear the philosophy of the next potential leader of Gateway. Well. Dr. Ritu Raju, who's the president who ended up being selected, the moderator of her session was Matt Kirkner. And so uh, so we joke we joke with each other that that I must have really done a good job of positioning yes. her for that for that role. I did well, I say that say that with uh, with a huge grain of salt because she's just an incredible yeah. incredible leader and she's going to do a great job there, but uh, just another spot where you and I cross over a little bit. Yeah. I know you're a futurist. I know you're always yeah. looking at what's coming next in in the world of technical education. You tap into some of the greatest brains in the industry and get a lot of great feedback and a lot of great influence. That way, what is a trend or two, Craig, that you're seeing? Um, we've talked about a few of them, obviously, credentialing and so on and right. work-based learning. Are there other trends that we haven't talked about yet that you're seeing in the industry that we should be having on our minds? Yeah. Uh, obviously, the world is all a buzz, and it needs to be about AI. Right. Right. So AI is going to be bigger than the Internet in mm-hmm. our world, I yep. think. And that's my everything I'm reading uh, and everything I'm experiencing. AI is going to make our world be- better yep. or worse. Yeah. Based better, on. Better, I think. I hope. But yeah. I, I feel it will. Be, but we got to have some ethics around that. So Agreed. So and then uh, one of the things in human spirit here is uh, the CTE instructor shortage. Yep. OK, so we need to really work with everybody, you and everybody that we've talked about and everybody right. beyond that to understand understand how to attract more CT instructors, faculty, and teachers into the K-16 space because if we don't have those people uh, ongoing, right. we're not going to have problems to attract students in or Absolutely. train our incumbent workforce. So that's our number one, one of our number one goals federally is to find best practices, and we've got some really good ones, to amplify and, and actually get some policies around better funding for instructors of CT especially, and also break down the barriers of the restrictions of you've got to have a degree higher than what you teach. Right. Okay, some of those things are 20th century thinking. We need to get outside those boxes and really carve up and make better our education system. Absolutely. And and I'm going to carve up, make up, I make better. I love the word disruption. We use yes. the disrupting technical yeah. education right in the tagline every every week for the tech for the tech ed podcast. Yep. Um, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, the the challenge of finding CTE instructors is is a huge one. Yep. Uh, it, it is a financial one. And when you've got somebody that can make, you know, $150,000, $200,000 in industry right. and bring them into a community college where, there, look, there's a lot a lot of benefits of being there, and right. including working through a mission and, yep. and some of the benefits that go along with it and, and, the, and the schedule and so on. There's, there's not to take benefits away 
from the, the conversation because there are huge benefits, but but it's a tough competition and it's tough to convince somebody to take a you know fifty percent or more pay cut to come right. into education. Yep. And yet with the biggest challenge, not just in industry, but it's an American challenge, right? right? If we can't find a way to to create this next generation of American manufacturing talent as manufacturing right. is coming back to the United States, as it's becoming more technical, as it's becoming more automated, right. we're missing a huge, huge, huge opportunity. We had Azatash Padi record a he's the uh, managing director or managing partner actually for North America for McKinsey and company yeah. on the podcast with us a week or so ago that that re- that episode is going to drop I think in another in another week and he was talking about all the innovation that takes place in manufacturing and the fact that in his in his mind because we haven't filled these manufacturing jobs in the last 10 years we've missed out on two two I think it was like 2.5 trillion dollars of GDP here wow. in the United States and you think about how many times that money would reverberate through our economy, you really get a sense for how huge this problem is. Yeah. And and so we have to find more individuals to, to get into the world of technical education. I think you use AI, as you talked about, and, t- and other technology yeah. learning and so on as a way to complement that path. It, yeah. It's not going to replace a teacher. Uh, it never will, but 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 as a way to complement and give the options for the right for the right students. But we need to disrupt this in, in big ways. And, and I really, really admire and acknowledge the incredible work you're doing from a public policy standpoint and an advocacy standpoint along those lines, because it, it's absolutely mission critical, again, not just for education, not just for industry, but for our very w- way of life here in the United States. You've had such a fascinating background, Craig, and and, uh, and we could probably go on for another hour or two. We're we're getting a little bit short on time, and so I want to want to end our time together with one last question. It's sure. a question we'd love to ask our guests here on the Tech Ed Podcast. Yeah. Let's go all the way back to you know before the amazing work that you're doing now, before your work in industry, before your your time in uh, in undergrad and in, in your technical college degree, all the way back to the 15 year old J. Mm. Craig McAtee. <laughs> and, and I want to ask you if you had one piece of advice. For that young man, Craig, what would that be? Well, my father was a great influence, and so was my mother in my life. But I would have uh, wanted to find one or two really strong mentors yep. that I didn't at mm-hmm. 15. Right. And also read about world news and understand the world better. Okay. So those two things kind of go That's hand awesome. in glove. Yeah. I would have I would have liked myself to do that much earlier than I actually did. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and obviously you managed to catch up, right? Because you've got an incredible knowledge and <laughs> in, in, in worldly understanding of how all these pieces fit together. But that's really, really good, uh, really good advice. There's nothing better than the, the power of a, a great mentor right. and somebody that we can that we can use as an example, bounce ideas off and, and maybe even, you know, get us back on track when, when they see right. us veering off, off track a little bit and certainly a knowledge of how these people all these pieces fit together we are in a in a global economy yeah. and and we have global technological innovation and understanding how all those pieces fit together same time scary and really exciting yeah and, and to me it's more exciting than it is scary i and agree I, just, I can't wait for the future i love the way you and your organization are leading us into the future j craig mcatee the ceo and executive director of the national coalition of advanced technology centers ncatc Awesome conversation. I really enjoyed our time together. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Matt, very much. And I will tell you, we'll be at our national conference at Gateway in 2024. And Brian mentioned that to me this morning. <laughs> and you can guarantee that I'll be walking through the front doors to see all the great things that you're doing. Can't wait to keep working with you, Matt. Thank you. Me as well. Thank you.